back. Um, we're going to start the second half of our morning uh, morning papers now. Uh, you could uh, come up. Uh, this talk is uh, about Scikit Fuzzy uh, Fuzzy Logic Toolkit, um, and uh, I'd like to welcome Joshua. Um, Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to attend and present here at SciPy this year. Um, right off the bat, I'd like to just uh, not do any false advertising. So if anybody's mind is, is thinking that this is a talk about fuzzy string matching, it's not. So if about a third of the people in here get up and walk out, I, that would be uh, not offensive to me. Um, fuzzy logic, in fact, is a set of ideas that was developed by Zade in uh, Berkeley. Actually, he took some thoughts from earlier in the, tw uh, the 20th century, but he's usually the, uh, the father of fuzzy logic, uh, or is ascribed to be the father of fuzzy logic. And the idea is that you can teach computers using um, human knowledge and, and expert input to make human-like decisions um, in an uncertain world, because we really do live in an uncertain world. Um, and uh, this, the quote here is that, from the father of fuzzy logic, is the closer you look at a real problem in the real world, not necessarily something that you'd see in a, uh, in a perfect science paper or, or a mathematics paper, but something in the real world, um, the, the fuzzier it becomes. And in fact, fuzzy logic is all around us, and I, all of us probably use it every day without having any idea that's actually what's going on behind the scenes. It is heavily used in industry um, for embedded systems, because it's, uh, because, uh, em yeah, embedded in control systems, it can be very precise and have great results um, with an understandable system that is still highly nonlinear and desirable. So the outline of this talk is basically I'm going to go over a little bit about fuzzy logic, or a little bit more about fuzzy logic. And, uh, and again, it's not fuzzy string matching. Um, I'll sort of do a schematic toy example and go through a live demo. I know everybody says not to demo, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and then go through a schematic, not a mathematical, but just show you um, one of the ways in which fuzzy logic could be used uh, in a fuzzy control system. Then I'll tell you a bit about the package itself, and what's in there right now, and what, uh, where we'd like to go. So first off, what really is fuzzy logic? So the whole point of this is to use rather intuitive and linguistic terms that all of us are familiar with because we speak language in some way, shape, or form. Um, and language is a powerful tool. It's actually been condensed down through, you could think of it as an evolutionary uh, type of, an English major would agree with me, I'm sure, uh, to be precise yet easily usable. And yet we're still um, computing using numbers and precise things that aren't necessarily easily translated. So um, with that we can build powerful models about complex systems that we are going to actually encounter in real life. So to, uh, to answer this, let's, let's ask a question. Now, I'm from the northern part of the country, um, and so this, this is an important question to me, <laughs> being down here in Texas. So how hot really is it outside? And weather underground, if you look it up, might give you one answer from one station. And NOAA would probably give you a different one, and the local weather station would give you a different one. Um, and the point is that, that we live in an uncertain world. And so none of these, all of these may be inherently correct, or they think they're correct, but they have uncertainties. Um, they're from different sources in different, slightly different places. And the point is that there are degrees of truth. So if we have, say, temperature on a, on, on a continuous variable range, um, well, the, the actual temperature, maybe weather underground, tells us it's 96 degrees outside. It's about what it's been the last few days. Um, but, but we know it really isn't that. And furthermore, how, how could I describe the way that I feel outside? Um, and so maybe, for me, anything over 70 is, is pretty hot, and, and anything over 90 is, is far too hot. Um, but if you're a native Texan here, well, maybe you'd describe it in a very different way. You might say, well, this is actually this is fantastic, cool weather, um, but, but then it's, it's just normal and with no upper bound, really, <laughs> for the people that are used to living in this. Um, well, okay, so now we have this, and then we can translate what we just said, uh, or rather, we could say this by, and I would just say, if the temperature's hot, then I'm looking for shade. I want to get out of the sun. And maybe if it's far too hot, then I'm running inside. Another point of fuzzy logic is that things don't necessarily have to add up to one, and only one thing doesn't have to be active at a given time. So it would be perfectly reasonable for me to be looking for shade while I'm running inside. Uh, <coughs> 
while perhaps the Texan's perspective would be if it's cool, then, then nothing happens. It's also perfectly fine to have a sparse system where not everything um, would have an action associated with it. And then if it's normal, then just get some lemonade uh, because it's, it's how it is always down here, apparently. So with that in mind, this is the kind of a fuzzy system, although I didn't really go anywhere with it. Let's actually move over to an IPython demo, which again, everybody tells you not to do that, but we're gonna do that. So we're, here we have an IPython notebook, and hopefully, yeah. where I've just put a demo that I've, that, that's about an ice cream parlor. It's, it's kind of a theme of temperature going on here. I'm not sure, entirely sure why, um, but let's, uh, let's just clear the cells out real quick and go through this. So starting back up at the top, we'll get the, uh, we'll get the PyLab tools. And so here, the, the point is that for a particular outside temperature, we're, we're dealing with a, a, a person that owns an ice cream parlor. And perhaps this person is not very computer literate. But he knows that when it's really hot outside, he gets a lot of customers. And when it's not, he gets fewer customers. And he wants to be able to predict that in some way, shape, or fashion. Um, and so the way you build a fuzzy system is you have these, these set of fuzzy rules, um, which are linguistic. And so it's very if. Uh, a press or yeah, if an antecedent, then a consequent happens, and both of those are defined on uh, our fuzzy variables. And so our our proprietor says, if it's hot, if it's really hot out, then the ice cream parlor is crowded. If it's moderate out, then the ice cream parlor is just busy. And if it's cool out, uh, then it's then it's empty. There's just no one in here. That's that's intuitively obvious. So let's uh, let's import. The, the relevant packages, and then let's describe the system. Now, the way this is described, there are uh, several different fuzzy membership generators within scikit-fuzzy. There's actually at least 12 and growing, um, but these are just all triangular and trapezoidal membership functions. Uh, they're well, the API is well documented, and, uh, and the point is they all describe or work on just simple numerical one rank, uh, rank one numpy arrays, and they also return rank one numpy arrays. Um, so maybe with the proprietor, we've described this fuzzy system. And let's just look at what that looks like. OK, so, um, so if it's cool out, we're saying that the cool starts at about 30 degrees, and then it's gone by 65, mostly dominant if it's below uh, about 45. And then this is moderate, and uh, that extends up to about 80. And then above that, it's considered hot. So then for the number of customers, he used different terms. He didn't say busy, sorry, he didn't say um, empty, moderate, and, and, uh, and crowded. He said crowded, busy, and moderate. And so these aren't necessarily entirely symmetric triangles. Um, and that was deliberate, maybe you worked with him on, uh, on what he thought these should be. And so then we can use another piece of scikit-fuzzy, which is um, the actual, the relations between these two variables. This is, all, this is standard stuff, but if you're not, familiar with fuzzy logic, I'm just, just going through it. So what these relations are, there's actually there's several relations available in the literature. There are two available in scikit-fuzzy right now. If you have uh, or would like to implement more, they aren't particularly complicated. We would love pull requests. Um, and I'll say that again later. But uh, for, each, for each rule in this fuzzy system, you have a separate yeah, for each rule in, in, the, uh, in the linguistic system, you have a separate fuzzy relation. Um, and then they're all active at the same time, so you need to combine them. And, uh, and then we can just go ahead and calculate this and visualize it. It doesn't take much time at all. And it also isn't necessarily all that intuitive. You're not going to be making conclusions based on this. But it is a very important part of uh, the fuzzy analysis. Basically, what this chart tells us is the fuzzy relationship between temperature for every level, uh, so, so for at every degree of temperature, this is in Fahrenheit, sorry, people that aren't uh, from the US, um, you, we're getting the fuzzy membership function associated with how many customers we would expect. And so we've gone from 1D, now it's a 2D array. But of course, we do actually need to predict something at some point. Um, and so that's called defuzzification. When we bring this back from the uncertain uh, grayscale logic space into a more certain value which you can actually work with and, and make a prediction. Otherwise, it wouldn't be all that useful. Um, so to defuzzify this, let's just hypothetically, oh, I, yeah, I edited this slightly. So we'll just get greedy and we'll, uh, we'll defuzzify the whole the whole spectrum for every degree so we can see the predictions all the way down. And then the result we get is a 
for, for this 75 degree, hypothetically, we're predicting about 20 people will be in the ice cream parlor. Um, the point here is that we get this wonderful nonlinear intuitive result, and we understood exactly what went in, and we understood all the way through, um, you, you've retained that intuitive understanding, which is not necessarily the case um, in a lot of the black box, for example, machine learning models that we've been talking about at this conference. It's also one of the reasons that it's used so heavily in industry and the like, because you retain the intuition. And it's actually very easy if your uh, expected data, so if the proprietor started actually writing things down as far as how um, many people really are in his ice cream shop based on what the, uh, the temperature is, it was, it's, it's trivially easy to go back to the definitions and recalculate these and improve your predictions. In fact, control systems doing exactly that are, uh, are routinely in use with a, with a feedback mechanism, um, again, in industry mostly. But uh, some of them are called neurofuzzy, it depends with a, a neural network associated with a, like a fuzzy neural network. But the point is um, that it, you've retained your intuition and yet we still have this powerful nonlinear predictive result. And then, well, let's, I said 75 degrees here, but the, then in Texas we'd expect a few more people in the ice cream parlor, un, uh, unsurprisingly. So moving back to, moving back from the demo, um, all of the membership functions I showed you were, uh, were trapezoidal or uh, triangular in this case. And in fact, that's, that's why the, uh, the logo looks like it does. It's not trying to ape the Star Trek Next Generation thought, uh, font or something. Uh, it's actually all generated using fuzzy membership function generators. But, uh, but, there's, <coughs> but there's 12 different membership function generators in there right now. And, and these are just some of the results that you can get. Um, you, there are sigmoids, Gaussians, double Gaussians, double sigmoids, piecewise function generators. It's, it's a lot of options to create different fuzzy membership functions. None of these are particularly hard to program, but, uh, but it's just overhead um, that, that you want to get out of the way if you want to attract people from, for example, MATLAB. Um, so to give you an idea how simple this is, I sort of showed that in an example, but to generate this membership function, it's a simple two-liner uh, where you have the universe variable and then the triangular membership function. Now again, that's a fairly easy thing to code up, but, uh, but just having this avail available will make it more generally, uh, more generally accessible. So for where the, um, sorry, I skipped over one example. So we'll go back and talk about fuzzy control systems uh, for a moment here. Now, we're all in this wonderful convention center. And for those of you that are staying here, you may have noticed that your air conditioning uh, operates like this. <laughs> I've got a theme, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, but it, it's binary. So it, you have a desired temperature, and if it, it, once it rises a certain level above that, it turns on, cools down. Once it's so far below, now it turns off, and it's gonna be off until it gets back to that same upper level, and it just repeats. You get this sawtooth-like function. It isn't um, inherently, it, it, it's a easy to generate system, but it isn't necessarily the best system that we can get. Um, a more advanced system would use fuzzy control. And I'm not going through how you would do this, but it would be pretty easy to have a series of membership functions around your desired temperature um, where you had a set of rules that might read something like, if you're near the temperature, turn the fan off. If you're above the temperature, turn the fan on at a low level. If you're very far above the temperature, then max that fan out because I'm sweating. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and that would give you a more tightly controlled system where, you're, uh, where it would look more like this. So, as far as the features that are available in Scikit Fuzzy right now, um, there's the, the import uh, brings most of the functionality into the base namespace. And the reason that decision was made, um, aside from the fact that I was looking at the NumPy imports uh, at the time when I wrote it, was because um, the, peop the, the intended users are largely coming from or have been exposed to this maybe perhaps through MATLAB. And MATLAB's structure is kind of dump everything into one directory and have it all available. So, um, so we bring a lot of functionality into the base namespace. Although if you disagree strongly with this, please express yourself and, uh, and we might, you might be able to convince me to do it uh, a different way. So uh, there's a membership sub, uh, sub, uh, subfolder where we have 12 different membership functions to create fuzzy memberships. Uh, yeah. So, Generators for create physical membership functions. There's a, uh, I believe, 26 and growing uh, different mathematic uh, 
functions that you can do with uh, with fuzzy with fuzzy membership functions in fuzzy math. Uh, and then there's at least six different defuzzification methods in fuzz.defuzz, the most common, which is default is just centroid. Uh, they're the center of gravity method. There's also a fuzzy C means clustering algorithm, which I'm a little bit scared to advertise because it's pure Python. And for those of you that have millions of data points, um, you would run screaming with its performance in the uh, current time. But it, uh, Fuzzy C-means differs from K-means, where K-means classifies everything crisply, but the fuzzy C-means um, doesn't attempt to actually draw hard boundaries, and you will give, it will give you partial uh, membership in several different classes, and uses that all the way along as it attempts to um, cluster the data. And so you get perhaps, I don't have an example for that right here, but, uh, but it's easy enough to run that and see for yourself. And then there's also denoising with uh, what's known as a fire filter. Those were introduced, I think, in the late 80s or early 90s. But the idea is that you, uh, it's fuzzy inference ruled by else actions. This adds an else at the end of all of those uh, uh, fuzzy statements. And the idea is you can uh, denoise. It's, it's designed to get rid of impulse noise. And it does a fantastic job of it. Um, so we'll skip ahead to where we are at the moment. So the documentation, the API is very well documented, but, uh, but I don't yet have a Sphinx, or like a Sphinx um, method or set up to grab all of that and make, a, make standalone documentations. But the doc strings are all there. Um, the examples are in process. I've got a few written, uh, and I'd love more examples from the community. Or if you use fuzzy logic, that's fantastic. Um, the fuzzy C means. Needs some love from Cython or something, uh, or a bit of refactoring. Uh, it's more or less a proof of concept implementation right now, but if it got fast enough, it could be contributed over into uh, scikit-learn probably. Um, then just more people looking at it, more people using it will, will, would be fantastic. Just uh, to, for reality checks, more bugs and doc fixes. Um, the goal is 100% test coverage. We're there for most of the, um, the key sub-packages right now, but uh, we don't have a fully 100% across the, uh, the entire thing yet, but that's a goal. And then, of course, community building, which is a significant part of why I'm here today. Um, so just to recap, the purpose of fuzzy, or Psychic Fuzzy is to provide the foundational tools for fuzzy logic. We've got a few interesting and neat examples in there already. There's many, 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 many um, implementations and um, possibilities that this could be taken and ran with, and that's more or less the point. We're giving you the tools. Um, to enable fuzzy logic in Python with a MATLAB-like syntax, um, but in the spirit of the scikits, where we use the bare NumPy arrays as our, as our data, and, uh, and it's very, very designed to be hackable uh, and extensible. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank a few people, notably uh, Dr. Hal Otteson, who wrote the original code for this. It was written in MATLAB, but it predates the MATLAB Fuzzy Logic Toolbox by three years. Uh, he was, he's been a subject matter expert in, in this since, well, practically since it, it uh, was introduced in the 70s. Um, I'd like to thank the Scikit Image team, who uh, took me from a, a neophyte Pythonista to where I am today, and of course you because really the point is to, to turn this over to the community and hopefully it can become uh, more than, and I've taken about as far as I can and we can and work together and make this something really fantastic. So I'd just like to conclude with, uh, there's a GitHub repo. The pull requests are entirely welcome and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so the question was, where is fuzzy logic most useful and where is it perhaps not as useful? When should I use it? Um, and the answer to that is that I didn't go into them here, but there are techniques you can use to actually take a nonlinear fuzzy system that you might have designed, like a fuzzy control system, um, and deconstruct that and figure out exactly what it really is doing if you had done it in, for example, conventional control theory. Um, and it might be a PID controller combined with something else with feedback, but you can actually deconstruct this. Um, but if you had tried to implement it in that way, it would have been much more difficult and non-intuitive, uh, harder to tweak. And so really, the, 
I've mentioned industry a few times. The reason is, I believe, uh, and I think it's a more than qualified assertion to make, the reason I think it's used so much in industry is because it, it retains that intuition. And so it's almost a prototyping step. So perhaps, um, so I showed you the fuzzy relation in the, in the example. It's really a lookup table after that point. So you, you make, you can do a little bit of calculation and then you can embed this into a chip that has almost no memory. Um, and that it's been used in that way since the 80s. Now, we have fancy cell phones now that we can have a whole lot more um, fun with. But for true embedded systems or for low power systems, it's, uh, uh, it's still highly relevant. And particularly for prototyping. So does that answer your question? Yes, very high level control where you can have a powerful system and it's easier to prototype. Perhaps you could optimize it further after that within or without the fuzzy landscape. But yeah. So what's a negative example? What should I absolutely not do? Fuzzy logic is difficult to apply to if you don't have a, if it's a categorical variable rather than a continuous variable, for example. Um, you can kind of approximate that by saying, um, we have fuzzy membership and then you have like a, 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 another fuzzy axis for zero to one for if it's blue, for example. Um, a much better way to implement a fuzzy system in color space is to do it with a, um, a radian based system uh, with like, like a color wheel. Uh, but anyway, categorical variables are a challenge for fuzzy logic. It's, it's uh, mainly intended for continuous. That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, and that's just the simple fact that you can even ask that question means that you've retained the intuition of the system all the way through and that it's very easy to go back and modify things and rerun it. I mean, that demo took no computation time at all. Um, and even if you had it more complex, it would still take almost no computational time at all. So the, I don't have a system and I haven't looked into that kind of an example because I've mainly dealt with like toy examples and the like. But I can tell you that it would be fairly easy to investigate with this kind of a framework. Whereas if you had a similar set of assumptions and you had put it into a classical control system and now you're trying to figure out why it doesn't work perfectly, where are you? It's not a friendly place. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>